and welcome to episode two of the Maverick Games podcast. I'm Mike Brown, Creative Director at Maverick Games, and joining me today is... I'm Harinda, or H as everyone calls me. I'm COO at Maverick Games. I'm Ellie Marshall. I'm Director of UI UX at Maverick Games. And last but not least... Fraser Strachan again, Audio Director at Maverick Games. Very cool. So, as always, we'll start off with a with a what you've been playing. So, uh, Ellie, why don't you tell us what you've been playing lately? So, I've been playing uh, Dead Space just recently. Um, I've been waiting for that to come out. There's a lot of nostalgia there for me uh, with that series. Uh, really great to get back into it. Um, there's lots of fond memories in there, and it's really good to see it um, coming back onto the big screens and for uh, next generation of, of people to come and play it. Is it is it how you imagined it, it would be remastered? Because because I remember the original like feel, felt pretty incredible. Like is it is it just as good or? Yes, it is. It is. It is really good. Is is keeping me hooked and the the audio especially. You know they they won awards previously um, for audio, so it's really 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 good to get back into that kind of stuff. I'm re I'm really keen to get into it because I I actually only ever played Dead Space three, and um, I never played one and two, and I always thought I'm just going to go back and play it. And especially when they they brought out the um, the Xbox 360 stuff on back compat on on Xbox. I thought I'm, I'm going to go back and play it, but there's just been so many other games since then. And now the remasters come out. I'm I'm definitely going to go and check it out. I really loved how you used some fond memories there when talking about a, <laughs> an absolute hellscape. It's like usually people would save like fond memories for like a new holiday resort that maybe you've not been to since you were a kid and you went back there. Oh, this is really nice, but yeah. no dead space. <sighs> Bit of an insidious mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, Fraser, what have you been playing? Um, so I have uh, actually been playing quite an old game that has just been remastered as well, uh, Age of Empires 2, you might have played it. Um, really interesting to go back to a game which I played for like, it was like a whole summer's worth of play when I was maybe like 13, 14. They've they've done a really good job with adding accessibility into into oh, the game because straight off I think it's a really good trend in games at the minute that uh, you know the first thing you hear is uh, press A to to do this and it, you you have to go in and basically choose to turn off that option which is kind of cool so they've added all of that stuff to make it much better to play on console which is which is really great oh you play on Xbox yeah 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 so so they did bring it out uh, a little while ago on PC and. Um, I'm just not a PC gamer. I just I just can't get around to specking out one of the PCs and having to keep it up. It's just it's not a hobby I I really want to get into. So definitely a console gamer. But um, yeah, they, they've done a really good job of getting the controls feeling pretty good. Like the, I think the camera speed is all is all pretty good. So it gives me a lot of hope for um, sort of those types of uh, top down RTS games uh, like for the future because I, I played a few on console mm -hmm. and it's like yeah this was. Uh, this is just a port for console. Yeah, um, Halo Wars and Halo Wars Two are pretty good. They're obviously built for the pad first and foremost, but I thought they kind of cracked it a little bit. Yeah, I think that was potentially at the point where I thought there's no way that this will feel as good on console as it will on PC. Mm -hmm. So I, I never actually played it on console, but um, yeah, I think I think I'll continue to play games like that now that. I mean, if a game like Age of Empires 2 has cracked it, then mm. like any any modern RTS is is gonna have cracked it. So I've been having a really good time with that. Probably won't continue too much longer with it. I've I've had my nostalgia fill, and I think I'm <laughs> think I'm ready for something else. Cool. So I have been playing the the excavation of Hobbs Barrow, um, a game that answers a lot of questions, such as what is a barrow and why does a hob have one, um, <laughs> which were the questions I certainly had coming into the game. It's set in I don't think it calls that the year, but I guess maybe turn of the 20th century in a, the fictional town of Bewley in Yorkshire. Um, I've lived in Yorkshire and I, I can relate a lot to the experience that um, the main character has in this game as they arrive in a small quaint Yorkshire village only to be told to get out by all of the locals. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need no outsiders around here. Worst thing they did was build that train. Um, Sadly more West Country than Yorkshire, I didn't know. Well, that's apologies. Probably but that's better than I, I Honestly, the accents in the game are not flawless, so. <laughs> so but, it but it really captures the vibe. She goes into this like little, little pub and basically everyone's kind of just like, Rude to her, and the, the, it's a point-and-click adventure where you there's like a kind of mystery element to it, and, a, and actually pretty effective horror element to it as well. Uh, all done in the art style of like, I want to say um, Broken Sword, but that's probably a little bit like probably more like Beneath mm. the Steel Sky, those kind of uh, Revolution Software games of the early nineties. Um, 
a really, really fun game, really cool puzzles, um, all voiced as well, which not a lot of games were back in the uh, early 90s because yeah. they would have had to try and fit on a floppy disk. Um, so yeah, and like, as I say, it's got all quite, quite humorous accents. I imagine if you're not British, you probably enjoy it a little bit more because you're not like, that guy's not from Yorkshire. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's close enough. I can tell that's acting. Yeah. yeah, it's a really small team though. I'm not sure how big Cloak and Dagger games they made it is, but um, obviously very, very small and like a real like passion project for them. It's really yeah. cool. Cool. H, what have you been playing? So I feel like this is where you're all going to go, oh my God, roll your eyes a little bit. Um, <laughs> Fortnite. No, no. So I have been for quite a few years, in fact, been quite heavily invested in a, I will call it a mobile game. You guys might not think of it as a game, but it's called uh, Design Home. Um, I'm, I'm looking at Mike because cool. I'm yeah. pretty sure he's going to be rolling his eyes now. <laughs> I'm not here to pass judgment. I just, <laughs> I mean, I, I just, did you hear the game I just described? I've been playing. Yeah. It's not like, it's a, cool. I'm, I'm, I'm not like exclusively <laughs> like AAA console. I can it, play other stuff. It does sound like a game. It's not just like yeah. the IKEA app. Oh like, no no no! no. <laughs> 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 just like, I don't see that. <laughs> yeah. Probably be cheaper to be fair if I did that. So it is where you you have little challenges and you can. It, it's it's for the interior designer. I'd say so. Spend a lot of time they give you a little brief of the kind of room that you can it's it's rooms not the whole yeah. house yet right so you design these rooms and you can do whatever you want and then you, it goes out to voting i was pretty high on the leaderboard for quite some time i'm not gonna lie <laughs> <laughs> like public vote yeah 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 oh, wow yeah, yeah. Okay. so it's, yeah and you yeah. can you know part of you you earn tokens by voting yourself so it's really cool most of my, obviously most of my rooms have hit five out of five. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure my partner plays that as well. And she is so addicted to it. She always turns around and says, like, Compelling, not addicted. Stars? Compelling. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the, the game team want you to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Look. Uh, but yeah, I, can, can I have a link to that, please? Yeah, I'll send you it. Yeah. <laughs> if I send you it, maybe I'll get some extra tokens. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, definitely. But I, I um, my husband doesn't know this, but I, I think I'm about, I'm, I'm Three thousand pounds invested. So, sorry, sorry, half if you're listening. Um, yeah, I have spent a lot of money. And what? I can't. I, I have to. I have to. I know. I know. I have to turn off notifications and push messages because every time I do, I literally I cannot open it without spending fifty quid. Do they send you actual furniture then? So you, you're paying three thousand pounds for this? No, no. I, I, that's really funny you say that because it was at one time where my husband did say, "Buy the coffee table. Just buy the coffee table in the house." <laughs> <laughs> it's great honestly well you weren't joking when you said the Ikea app would be yeah, cheaper no, yeah, no, yeah. Well, but, but there was that time that when Halo came out and I was like who would pay 50 quid for one of these packs of cards and you were like I I've, I've paid I've paid hundreds of pounds shut up <laughs> my wife will be watching this <laughs> that was a real foot and mouth moment yeah, yeah but it's see, great you used to see my FIFA ultimate team bill <laughs> <laughs> it's great I recommend it it's great I love it Cool. Cool. Um, all right. So I, I called, I marked on at this point that we should uh, call out our socials. So um, if you're enjoying the podcast, then feel free to hit that subscribe button, hit the like. That really helps us out in ways that I don't actually understand, but I but I do understand that I'm supposed to say that. Uh, the, the also, number goes up. The number goes up. Yeah, the yeah that's goes a good up. thing. Yeah, right? yeah. Also, if you follow us at, at Maverick Games on Twitter, you'll get all of our latest news first. Um, all right. So, H, you want to come on to talk about a particular topic today? Yeah, well, I thought as today is International Women's Day, um, we thought it was a good opportunity for both Ellie and I to come on and talk about the importance of having women in the tech world. You know, having having females in leadership roles are really important. Some of the things that we thought about really early on in our journey at Maverick, why we want to make sure that, you know, it's a, a place of belonging. You know, we don't we haven't talked about we don't we don't want to be a tick box. You know, we don't want to just say have those have those things on our website where it's just we, you know, we are a diverse employer. We are, you know, we're we're inclusive. But actually what I care about and I think what everybody here cares about, and we talked about this a lot, is about creating a place of belonging Absolutely. and what that means for everybody here and where, you know, whether you're, you know, a woman or a person of colour or from any marginalised group, nobody cares for all the right reasons here because we just embrace great people and nobody's going to judge you on for any reason it's just a really empowering environment and i think that's quite a, a special place to be so i thought it was a good opportunity for us to talk about that here so i will just say as well because some of the people watching this might not be game developers they might well be gamers that are looking for info and 
I will just share that my experience is that um, over time, as the games I've worked on, the teams have got more and more diverse. I think nowhere near really the goals for diversity, but I've seen um, so much, like, such a huge quality improvement um, in the way that we make the games and also the quality of the games themselves as you're bringing in those um, those diverse views and those, those diverse backgrounds. It makes such uh, an incredible difference to the way that people contribute in meetings and the, the experiences that they share based on their own lived experiences. Um, so you may well be thinking, why do you care if you're just someone who wants to play some games? Well, um, I can tell you from experience that it absolutely makes for better games. Um, and I think that the industry is starting to notice that. Definitely. Um, it's yeah. just yeah. Yeah. Mo moving it, quite slowly. Yeah, and it's really, it's really important because we, not just for our community of players, because we want our community of players to be diverse. We want to attract that, that, you know, the right kind of people on that, but also for our teams, you know, we're not, we're not making games for just one person, right? We're not making games for a certain demographic. We're making from games for everybody. So, our, you know, if our dev teams reflect that, we, it's going to show in the game that we're making. It's really important. So, yeah, it's, it's, you, you do see the difference. Um, I've, I've been in the industry for 16 years. And when I first started, it's literally the only woman, you know, and, you know, I've quite often been in meetings where you know, there's 30, 30, 30 people attending and I'm the only woman still to this day, you know, and that's it just doesn't need to be that way. So um, this is really refreshing. I don't think you see many people, well, certainly not many founding teams where there is two females um, and I feel really proud to be part of this. Yeah, have you have you found there's been a, a big shift in in the time you sort of mentioned there are still meetings that you go to where you're you're still the only woman in, in those meetings but have you found there is a general shift in in that kind of tone yes and no I think uh, I'll say yes here because it definitely has feels different here but you know over the years I think there still isn't that present from a leadership perspective. I think we've st there's been a lot of work, and there should continue to be a lot of work at gr that grassroots level. Grassroots level can say that word, where people go. You know, we go to school and we have an impact, and it's really important to get kids at that twelve to thirteen age where they, they can. That can change the way that they they move forward. It can change everything. It's having that influence at the right time. So they, you know, those kids need to see diversity in the people that are stood up in front of them, um, and I think. Having that, having I'd say people like me as a as a as a woman, person of colour, for them to see me and what we've been doing here, I think that's I think that's quite an impactful thing for them. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think so. At junior level, it's certainly starting to flow through to our dev teams, um, and I hope that continues to be be the case as we as we grow. We're, we're certainly I, I don't know whether you guys, but I'm really impressed with the amount of diverse candidates that we're seeing through the Maverick portal. It's incredible. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. And yeah. if you did want to apply, it's uh, www.maverick-games.com. You um, should apply. It's great. It's um, really good. Really so, good. so Ellie, you've also been in the industry for a very long time. What kind of changes have you seen? Um, so yeah, I've kind of been in the industry a similar time to you, H, haven't I? And I think... Um, we we met at Codemasters years and years and years ago when you were just starting out. Yeah, when I was just I think I must have been twenty or twenty one or something like that. I won't say how old I am now. I was um, I was twenty one as well. <laughs> 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 um, and you know um, when I to, to get in like for me to get into the industry, you know, is is I started out in Codemasters and you know I was a bit of a fan of Codemasters back in the day. Um, I applied to Codemasters when I was 15 years old and I hadn't, wow. I hadn't got any GCSEs or anything at that point. Um, I thought I was playing Colin Cray uh, Rally, one of those games, and I looked in the, in the booklets back in the day and I had a list of all the credits. I was like, oh my God, I really want to be in there. Um, I and, love that. <laughs> um, they, they didn't employ you when you were 15. Though. No, no, no. <laughs> um, but, but my dad said, he said, oh, do you know they're actually only in Salvum? That's like literally 10 minutes from where I lived. I like, oh my God, I've got to write to them. So I wrote to them. I was just like, oh, I'd really like to work for you. Um, and they blessed them. They did write back to me and they said, oh, he needs like actual qualifications. Uh, to come <laughs> you actually need to be an adult. <laughs> yeah, 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 I need to be an adult. <laughs> Um, and um, so I, I went off and um, I did uh, graphic design. That's, that's my background, that's what I'm passionate about. That's how I got into UI and UX. Um, and I, I went back to Codemasters after I'd got a degree in graphic design, worked in a graphic design studio for a year, 
And I thought, do you know what? I'm going to try again. Um, and I remember standing at the post box with my CV in my hand, thinking, do you know what? Fuck it. <laughs> Beep. Beep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and I, and I, and I, um, I thought, you know what? Uh, if you don't hear anything, you don't hear anything. At least you've tried. Um, and then they got back to me and uh, I went in for an interview um, and uh, it was a great interview. And then it took three months for them to uh, offer me a job because oh, three months of turmoil, have I? Oh. Have I? Have I? And um, I got my first job in the industry and I was, a, I was a junior UI artist and that was nearly 16 years ago. That's great. Um, Did they remember you from, from when you applied the first time? I, I mean, know. I can't imagine they I don't would. No, I don't, don't think. I don't think so. No. I don't think so. So, how did you um, applying like as a fifteen-year-old, and then you know this company that you really want to work for says, "Oh, you need some qualifications." How did you then decide to do graphic design and know that that was going to lead to a, a path within the industry? Because honestly, at that age, I was like, "I want to. I want to make games, but does that mean I have to like?" play games like like yeah. you know for a living or or be able to code like i didn't really know what that meant no well um doing graphic design it was a passion i always knew i wanted to do it because there was something about problem solving um that i really liked um mm -hmm. and i actually didn't know that there was a place for graphic design in the games industry i applied again through having um, a bit uh, a degree um, and actually finishing my qualifications in a, in a bit of art design, you know. Um, so I kind of went in with a bit of kind of speculative CV. There was I didn't apply for any particular role, um, but I did think a lot about the CV that I did send in, um, and I thought, right, how am I going to stand out from the crowd? And I thought, who do I need to get in contact with? And I got the contact from Codemasters. I phoned them up. Um, and I spoke to somebody and they gave me gave me a name. And so I wrote, I wrote specifically to this person and um, I did this uh, uh, beautifully laid out CV. It was something that you kind of like opened up and it said uh, something like on the front, uh, somebody told me once to always aim high when you opened it up. It was like, so I aimed high, that kind of, that kind of thing. Nice. Uh, I've still got it at home. I've still got a copy at home, I'll bring it in. Um, um, but um, yeah, so that kind of led me on to to getting my first role in the industry. Wow! wow. And you uh, sent it through like the conventional post. Through conventional a, with post, a, with a yeah, with a beautiful envelope as well. Yeah, was, something I, that you like to touch and smell. I, I was thinking then when you kind of described the kind of experience mm -hmm. of opening your mm -hmm. your CV. Yeah. Um, that would be so much more effective through conventional post. Mm -hmm. um, like you get, I mean, we, we get mail at work, right? But it is either stuff you just ordered to get to live the office or it's just spam. Mm. Um, I don't yeah. think I ever receive a mail where it's actually interesting. I was like, oh, wow. And that would still have been true. Yeah. Like, I, won't, I, won't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to age you, Ellie, but like <laughs> some, some years ago, email would, st would still have existed. Um, and they yeah. still would have still had a website where you would have conventionally gone and just uploaded a CV. Mm. So I, I bet that was really effective for that that manager to open that and have yeah. it addressed to them and open it up and be a bit targeted. So yeah. yeah, that which does, I think, quite nicely move us on to one of the topics that we were going to discuss a little bit later on, but I think that we naturally segue there now, which was uh, a question that was sent into questions at maverick-games.com by about 12 different people asking, have you got any advice on how to get into the games industry? Um, well, there was some advice. Um, I think that's probably... the. You, you did basically tell the entire story there, but I think the bit that's probably really valuable to people is to have that, to go for a particular mm -hmm. position, mm -hmm. even though there wasn't even a job on the website, mm -hmm. and really kind of target that particular studio, yeah. that particular individual, yeah. um, make yourself stand out. It's it's an interesting story because there are often people that um, will send through a really sharp CV or, or just do something that kind of grabs your attention at whatever for whatever reason at that time of day or, or that, that month, and you just kind of go, this this person looks like they'd be incredible, but we don't have a job at the minute. Um, and they can stick with you for, for a year, year and a half. Like, it's interesting because you would always say, like, just keep keep persevering. Like, something like that is going to... And you don't have to like make a bespoke like no, 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 handmade no. envelope. You're going to get loads of them now. Yeah, I think um, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just you know, not not realizing that the first time you try doesn't mean that it's never going to happen. And that's a really good point because I think 
you know, there's there's not enough roles for all the people that want to be in the industry. So you do have to stand out from the crowd, but never, don't worry about those knockbacks because they're there. You know, take each one. And I think we're doing, I'm, I'm really impressed with all you guys off the, the level of feedback they're giving to people. I think that's been really beneficial for everybody. But don't stop, you know, that's really the most important thing. And it's it's finding that right thing. I think what you did was follow, follow your passion mm -hmm, for Codemasters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that clearly showed in your application, even from that 50, from when you were 15 to when yeah. you're old. And that definitely stuck with you. So that it's almost, it is, where, which are the studios that you want to work for? You know, yeah. um, sometimes not working for a dr your dream IP isn't the best thing, but you know, I think there is definitely opportunities to go and push your CV, start standing out from the crowd. I personally, I'm, I'm a, I quite like a really nice covering letter. I think that shows out from the crowd. Mm -hmm. We don't get enough of them sometimes. No. I think just, a, or a, a, a little paragraph at the top of your CV talking about, why? Why? Yeah. 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 So, some of the people that I've already hired at Maverick Games, it was on the strength of the cover letter. So mm -hmm. I, would, I would absolutely yeah. back, agree I, with that. I completely agree. I think there's something that somehow is being lost in translation or covering letters. Yeah. And I think it's so important because it makes it makes it feel a lot more kind of personalised. Yeah, I think um, it, it's the it's the nature of the internet and having like all these jobs posted that you could literally apply to like five in in a few hours if you wanted to and it's so common that everyone's got a cv now like yeah. that's that doesn't make you stand out everyone's probably got a free website that you can build where you can put some portfolio work on there and obviously it depends on the how good that portfolio work that is on the website but everyone has that so that cover letter can be really important like one of the best ones that i read uh, that came through to maverick was was what this person thought a maverick like someone at Maverick Games was, and yeah. and and it it was great because it showed that um, not only had they researched the company to find out what what our values are, but they had obviously they felt in tune with it, and then they were able to sort of say it back to us in a way that was like, yeah, this person this person gets it, and you know, it just helps you stand out from the crowd, and I, I think it's so important. I just love that because that's almost, you know, we keep saying be a maverick. That's literally showing how they're going to be a maverick. That's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. 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 I think another like top tip I would give is um, I, the value of being able to get face to face with somebody from the studio you want to work at can't be, can't be overstated. H, I know you've been involved with those kind of events before uh, with Interactive Futures, which actually just, was just over the, the park there, wasn't it? Yeah. Which is where, where we are now. Um, I also got my, my break in the industry at a similar event um, up in Manchester, uh, where, so I, I went with my laptop and I had, a, had my demos and stuff that I've made on there. So rather than it being a kind of website, I kind of had it, it was playable. You could, you could, you could play the stuff that I've made. And, and, I, and Lionhead were going to be there. And I went there and I practiced it. I was a huge fan of. I was a huge fan of um, the Fable, which had recently come out, um, but also kind of the past games with Black and White, and even before that when it was Bullfrog, like Theme Park and stuff. Theme Park, one of my all-time favorites. Um, and so I'd gone in there with this kind of like a whole, all kind of mind prep and what I was going to say and how I was going to pitch myself to Lionhead. Um, and uh, to cut to the chase, obviously I've never worked at Lionhead, so that, that was completely unsuccessful. Um, but. <laughs> Um, but also at that event where a bunch of other studios, Rare were there, uh, Evolution Studios were, were there, and people that are, are more familiar with my, my working history will know that I did work at Evolution Studios. Um, and there's just actual developers there that are gone for the day to go and speak to meet, to meet little children like, like, like I was. I was like kind of still at university. And you kind of, when you're going over to them, like, and no one else at that point, because I guess it was a long time ago, had had a laptop with a playable demo on it, and you can go, like, here's a pad, and you can kind of talk them through what you do, you're kind of talking through the different things you've done and why you've done it. Um, and off the back of that, I, I got a job offer, and I was offered a QA position at Evolution Studios. Um, and that's that's it. Getting that first job is is the real hurdle you've got to get over. Because once you've worked somewhere, once you've shipped a game, um, after that, it becomes much, much e easier to move around and choose where you're, where you're going to work. Um, but I would say, that ability to get to an event where you'll be able to go and speak to people, show them stuff, because most devs are going to be interested. If you've got a little demo that they can play, they'll, they'll play it. They'll talk yeah. to you. Yeah. Um, I know from Interactive Futures, like we we had a few people from there when we yeah. were at previous yeah. place of employment, and um, I'm, I'm sure that's true for yeah. Uh, and and I was really heavily heavily involved with them with the, the setup for Interactive Futures and how that was going to be perceived, and it was really important about that being a it was a careers event. It was all about how do we you know. 
as a child, you really want to work in games, and but your, your parents might not think it's a viable career. It's about that understanding. And for lots of parents that had kids of that age, didn't know didn't know where the path was. And it's really important for knowing that actually this is, you know, this is a good place to be. And I think one of the biggest takings from that, and I remember, it's really interesting you talk about your experience, because to this, I think it was about four years ago was the first one. I remember some of the kids that I met and I have no doubt that they are going to have a brilliant career in the industry. And all they really needed was kind of, you know, coming towards um, picking my GCSEs. What should I do? What should I do? And the be- one of the best things I had was um, uh, one of the parents actually sent me a message afterwards saying, can't thank you enough. My 12-year-old son is doing double maths on a Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> you see the difference with the folks that come in where they have... Um, done some done some coding done some design done some basic when they're really young and it, it carries them through so i think you definitely getting it early on getting hands on and you've so many opportunities to do that now because things with you know for, for instance unity you know just getting hands on with unity you can do that you can do that really easily because it's free to download you can get onto the website you can go in you know play around with it go through the tutorials it's a great experience i think it's the it's for, probably very different from when you were starting out. You don't have those kind of things there. So there's so many opportunities to do that now. So. Yeah. Sometimes it's the long game as well. Like it's not always about just cramming yourself in the door and you'd like you've got to get to know people, but you've also got to get good at what you do and you've got you've got to really want it. Yep. So we kind of jumped ahead, so we'll jump back. We were talking about um, women in games. Uh, one of the things I wanted to touch on was um, salary transparency. We did cover that a little bit in the in the last podcast, um, but H, we were chatting earlier. Actually, you were talking about how that's actually a really powerful thing when you're trying to bring in a more diverse team. Oh, it absolutely is. I, I'm so proud that we did that from day one. I think it was a really easy conversation for us, really, wasn't it? When we originally came in, I think it was day two where we said we're going to do this, and everybody was like, "Yes, yeah. let's do this." Yeah. And and you're you're 100 right. That 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 point about any women, anyone from a marginalised background. They generally, they, we do not negotiate. That is our biggest downfall. We do not negotiate, and that's something that when you when you are not transparent with your salaries, and that it causes discrepancies, right? And I know myself in a previous workplace, I had a huge discrepancy, and it was one of those things that always plays on your mind, and you just think you doubt yourself, right? You doubt yourself, thinking, "Why am I? Am I not doing?" That? I think I'm doing a good job, but I'm not really sure. So mm-hmm. it takes those things away, really. So it means that right from day one, we do not, we talked about this even before we started, we don't want to have a gender pay gap. It's really important for us. This is really early on having these conversations where we don't want anybody to feel like they're underpaid. We've taken money off the table. It means that you can bring, again, it's going about bringing your whole self. You can be, you know, you can 100% be who you need to be without worrying about anything. But even with our job descriptions, the way that we've put our job descriptions together, because now, for women, looking at a job description, if you can't do 30% of that, of what's on there, you're not going to apply. And that's, you know, there is loads of stats behind that, backing that up. You're just not going to apply. Whereas most blokes will look at it, <laughs> will look at it and just go, oh, I can do 30%. I'll, I'll apply for that. I'll explain it in the interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you don't, you don't have any of these skills. Yeah, but I can learn. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll have a three month notice period. I'll just learn those skills during that time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and do you know what? What I would say is if for anybody that is looking at looking at job descriptions and you think you haven't got all of those, all of the, the things that are kicked that are listed on there, you should apply because if you can do all those things, it's not right for you. You know, it has to be a challenge. There has to be things on there that are really important, you know. So I would say don't don't worry. And I, I think the way that we have put those together has really it's taken away that barrier. So um, so that's really important. I think that's such a breath of fresh air, like what we're doing and an absolutely bold move. And it was so good to hear like on like day two when we when we arrived at Maverick Games that, that we were thinking of doing this and we made the plunge to actually do it. And we've had such a positive response from it. Um, and I think the more the more kind of like dynamic and also maverick we can be about things mm. we can really really try and steer and drive the industry that we're that we're in to make to do new things and not be afraid mm-hmm. i think that's one of the, the the most 
amazing things about what we're doing we're not afraid to try new things yeah and we're yeah. not uh, we're not afraid to talk about what we are what we're really trying to implement in terms of like diversity and getting different groups in and all sorts of different types of people in and i think looking back at the years of, of being in, in in the industry it's it's we are changing we are changing but it's slow it's very very very, very slow and and i think Having having certain having a certain group of people come together from different backgrounds and really having that driving force within within the business from the get go, it's, it's it's difficult when a business is already established. But mm -hmm. when it's when it's brand new, when we've got the when we've got that mindset implemented straight away, we can we can make a difference, and I believe we will. And yeah. we are. We got we got we got new candidates that are coming in, accepted their offers. Yeah. And you know it's happening. It's 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 happening, and that's the most amazing thing is that it is happening and yeah. it's working. Yes, it's working. Yeah. It's working. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, um, and we'll continue to do it as well because I think um, I think some of them at the moment they're quite large ranges, aren't they? I think we have like yeah, environment absolutely. artists brackets all levels, mm -hmm. which is from graduate to 20 years experience within one bucket. Um, there's an administrative hurdle to get over there to kind of break those out and have a bit more granularity, but we will do that over the, the coming weeks uh, and for every job that we put up ever in the future. Yeah. It was uh, it, it was really funny because all of us, with all of our combined experience, we, we all said, this is something we want to do. And all the discussions around, should we not do this, were, were basically, well, it, it was, so why are these other companies not doing it? And it was all about, other, it was all about other companies, other people, like why, why are they not doing it? And, and eventually once we all just said, do you know what, this is what we want to do. We, yeah. we blank slate, let's not, let's not care about the way that it's been done before. Let's just try and do it right the way it should, should have been done. And when, when we put out that post, like the, the oh, response brilliant. was amazing, wasn't yeah. it? Well, I like, we, I like we, what we, you I, said actually, cause actually when we got to the point where it's like, nobody else is doing this. Why aren't anybody else doing it? And you're, 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 you saying actually, sounds like a very maverick thing to do. It's just like, <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we know the reasons that the people aren't doing it. It's, uh, it's expensive. It's, it, it'll, yeah. it'll cost you money because you don't get to exploit people in the way that you just described where people come in, they ask for a low figure, the company goes, cool. And yeah. when they would happily pay them an extra 10 grand. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing you I, know, we lose that as a benefit. Yeah. And, and, that, and we, what we have done from day one is hold our, hold our hiring managers to account. Mm. We cannot have a discrepancy going forward because mm -hmm. we've, we've made those transparent. And that's a really, even that is so refreshing. We are not going to have the baggage that others have because of that. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just, it yeah. was a bold move, but it was the right decision. It really yeah. feels like it was the right decision. And the thing I really like about it is it's, it's, not, a, it's not a single one-off statement. Like once you start a Maverick Games in a particular role, in a particular salary, it's it's already obvious where your trajectory is like you know it takes the anxiety away from well if i'm here for five years am i gonna do i need to like hard negotiate it's just like it's it's already it's already taken away that anxiety you know that you've got a path of progression you know what the title progressions are, are going to be and, and really you're just working towards that because a lot of the time you get a promotion in the industry and you go, cool, what's next? Like that's, it's the nature of the human brain to kind of, you've achieved your goal, tick, I need a new goal. Um, and I think uh, hopefully that makes people feel more comfortable and takes away all those worries about money and um, you know, your, your title and just lets you just get your head down and be creative and, and kind of just make great games. And be on that journey with us. Yeah. That's yeah. what we talked about a lot. Yeah. I, and yeah. I love that. It's about people being on the journey, not needing to worry about anything. And yeah, we have been, and it goes, it's, it's being vulnerable. It's also being vulnerable and owning it. Mm. And actually just means that it goes back to people can be themselves. Mm. It really, I just think it's, yeah, there's no reason why. Like I said every, every reason we thought about where it, it may be a difficult thing to do or the wrong thing to do, we just talked ourselves out of that anyway. So yeah. it's just brilliant. Yeah. The, uh, on, on that similar subject, you mentioned the uh, gender pay gap earlier. Now, legally, we don't have to publish gender pay gap until we've reached 250 employees, a count that we may never reach. Um, so we're going to wait until we've got enough employees that it's, it sufficiently anonymizes the data because if, in a small <laughs> enough sample size, you might yeah. be able to reverse engineer what somebody's salary is. Um, but once that's at that point, which I don't think we're too far away from, we'll, we'll start to publish that yeah. as well, even though we don't actually have to. 
Another thing that I wanted to talk about that was kind of in this similar space is is role models and the importance of having uh, role models in this industry for people to look up to. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, from from my own perspective, um, like uh, the, the years I've been in, in the industry, I've always tried to create a space where everybody has a voice. Um, and, and I think... That's something I've kind of like learned along the way is, is to try and give people equal opportunity um, when it when it comes to being team players, um, when it comes to creating teams as well. You know, I've spent time creating teams uh, from scratch. I've been helped. I've helped fix teams. Um, and and that is to try and kind of try and unify and create a, a safe space for people to be able to have their voices heard, because I think sometimes when when we can be in such kind of like intense environments, you know, you've got a lot of a lot of people with their own opinions and things. Sometimes people can become very quiet and not be heard. Um, and I try and kind of make those voices heard and and and, and allow people to to believe in themselves that actually my voice matters. And I have said that to many people, and I, I've said to them, your voice matters. I've said that to people not just in the companies I've worked for, but other companies, other people have worked for. You know, I've had recent conversations with people and I've always said, your voice matters. Never think that it doesn't matter. If the person that's leading you makes you feel like your voice doesn't matter, they're not doing their job properly. Um, so so for me, um, I I try to create environments where people people do do feel like they can be themselves. And when I see other people doing that as well you know I, I aspire from what other people have shown me and and the right way to do things and the right way to allow people to grow um and and not be pigeonholed I don't I don't like people to be pigeonholed people want to, people need to grow and people need to learn and I need to grow and I need to learn you know at the same time um so so I I I I, I I never, I never want to like see people feel trapped or or not doing what they uh, they they can do. Yeah. Or and achieve. it's it's so important to hear those voices mm -hmm. because because I remember being like, when I first started in the industry and there was particular people uh, at the top, men who had particular character traits and and when you're when you're like fairly junior, you tend to look at the people above you and think, what do what what do I need to sort of replicate to to follow that path? And I think that's really dangerous because it en ends up taking you down a path that can be orientated towards a certain type of characteristic. And certainly um, throughout the years, as I've worked with more women, I've found that actually there's there's so many character traits that just aren't, that just weren't there in some of the meetings that I was having that I respect far more. And I think it's it's it helped me to develop as a, as a person and as a developer much better than than I did when it was just mm. lots of men in a room. Absolutely, and I think you can look at others and think, that's not what I want to be. Let's let's try and change that. Let's try and divert that situation yeah. into into something else. Yeah. Positive. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because um, as you were talking, there I was thinking, um, this might be quite bold to say, but um, since I've been in the industry, I haven't. I'm trying, I don't think I've ever had a female that I've reported into, I'm pretty sure. In fact, no, never. And in fact, actually, I'll go back to as far as that, because I worked in financial services prior to coming here, and my f my first role was as a junior accountant. That was, she was a woman, that's it. That's the only woman that I've ever actually, actually reported into. So um, it's a, it is a different approach, you're 100% right. And I think since I've been in the industry, I've always, I've always worried about the fact that I'm like you guys. I'm not. Uh, I'm not a coder. I'm not a designer. I'm not an artist. And I thought that was always the problem for me. I thought well, it's my problem. I can't do. I can't be a leader because I don't know any of those things. But actually, I think that's probably my superpower in lots of ways because you got. You don't need another voice telling you how to do things on the game. You've got that. You know. I think it's really important to have the right teams, put the right people together. Mm -hmm. You know, have the right people on the bus. You know, and in the right seats as well. Just as importantly, and then you. you you literally get out of their way and let them do the job that they need to do. That's really important. But actually, it's the support, and it, every person, as a you know, as a as a separate human, needs different needs. And it's about our job is about understanding that. 
So I think my the best thing I can do is is uh, to give clarity because that's really important for anybody. Um, direction and empathy. And I don't think there's enough empathy within games development sometimes. And I think that's a refreshing thing that um, that that I think a, di- a female perspective sometimes brings in. Yeah, because yeah. I, I mean, let's face it, there's developers at the best of times sometimes aren't the best at communicating or like figuring out problems together. Like 50% of any work environment is how you work with people. Absolutely. Um, like the, you can know your craft, you can be amazing at it, but if two people who know their craft and are amazing at it just don't know how to work with one another, then it's not going to work. You're not going to make a, a great game. And and I think I've seen that with, with you in Maverick, that, that you bring that, that level of helping to get people to understand how to work with people. And, and it is your superpower. Thanks. <laughs> um, you say something that reminded me, actually. Um, I did have a, a, a female as a... As a boss for a while, but Amazing. yeah, my my first boss at Evolution Studios, the QA manager at Evolution, was Zoe Collier. Oh. Uh, she was awesome. Um, nice. I'm going to get this wrong now. I'm pretty sure she's now senior producer at Cloud Imperium, so still in a pretty senior position at a top studio. So um, I might check that and then re-record that when we finish. <laughs> <laughs> so don't get that wrong and really really disrespect her. Um, but yeah, that there was, and there, there were very very few. Uh, women in the studio at Evolution Studios, but she was on the on the leadership team as a QA lead. So yeah, that was cool. And she was great. She's a great manager. Yeah. And there is some amazing women in our industry now. You know, I mean, my, I would say the people that I really look up to, Joe Twist, you know, CEO of Yuki, I think she's amazing. I think she's a real force. And, you know, I think we need women like that, actually. Um, for me, I would say my role model always used to be um, um, Cheryl, uh, Cheryl Sandbank. Uh, as as the COO of or ex COO of Facebook, I used to think, actually she's amazing. She's really cool, and that used to be my barometer of actually that's what I want to do. That's what I'm doing. I'm doing it now. I'm doing it now. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah Bond at Xbox also deserves a shout out. She is amazing. Like uh, such such yeah. an incredible like person and leader. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're my role model, H. Oh, oh. oh. thanks, Sally. Uh, uh, do you know do you know what there's been some fantastic women that i've worked with in the industry um there's a couple of producers that have that have been absolutely fantastic um i worked with a lady called susie wallace she's absolutely brilliant i worked with her for a bit um and also uh, liz clark absolutely brilliant they're both both are producers um, and both um, on like the leadership level of teams and stuff, and and they were so so good, so people orientated, um, really easy to talk to. Um, so it's really nice when you when you get that kind of collaboration with other women uh, in the industry and be able to kind of like um, make games as well. You know, I love the fact that every hiring manager so far, when we're t- we're talking about the candidate pool that you've got at the minute, there is women in there. Mm-hmm. There is. And some really strong women that we're really excited about. I think that's that's great. And even the ones that I've already accepted, I can't wait for them to get here. It's going to be amazing. It's just going to be so good. So, yeah. You'll have to look forward to meeting those on future episodes of the Maverick Games podcast. And if you'd like to join the team, then, of course, head on over to maverick-games.com and drop us your CV. Um, H, anyone particularly like to encourage to apply? Oh, that's a good question. Everybody, everybody, um, but women. And what do we mean by women? Anybody that identifies as a woman is more than welcome um, here at Maverick Games. Absolutely. Come yeah, definitely. Over. Come on over. Come and yeah. join the team. We are about out of time. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, then why not hit that subscribe button, hit like. If you'd like to ask a question that we could try and answer on a future episode, then you can message, you can email us, sorry, at questions at maverick-games.com or you can uh, hit us on Twitter, which is at Maverick Games on Twitter. Um, that's about it. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us and thank you for joining us at home. Uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Hashtag I am a Maverick. You've been listening to the Maverick Games Podcast. If you'd like to join this adventure, head over to www.maverick-games.com.